Jill Lugrin is an internationally renowned speaker on the topics of publicity and networking and a master strategist on how to capture the attention of the media and increase your visibility in the marketplace. For over 20 years, she served the business community, professionals, and celebrities to promote themselves and their work. A member of the National Speakers Association, Jill Lublin is a popular speaker and host of a nationally syndicated radio show, Do the Dream. And now, here's Jill Lublin. Thank you for joining me today. I'm so glad you've made this investment. You know, because in, well, in my business, there is a saying that with advertising, you pay for it. And with publicity, you pray for it. Today, it's my focus and intention to help you get the publicity you need. When I speak all over the country and lead workshops and trainings, I address thousands of people and help them get their word out and increase their visibility. Today, it's you and I helping you to get your message heard because the news is made up of you. And I'm going to help you understand how to make it happen more for you. When you watch television, when you listen to radio, when you read the newspaper, did you know it's all about us? We are the news. So it's important to understand how to create your news. One of the points is, for instance, when you read the people section of your local business journal, of your daily newspaper, there is a section in there called the people section. Guess what? You're the people. Turn what you do into a resource. Learn how to speak your expertise out. And part of that is about creating the ooh-ah factor. Let me tell you about the ooh-ah factor. Technical term, I know, but it's really about creating a story. A story that makes people go ooh and ah. Tell me more. It's attractive, it's immediate, it's attention-getting, it's powerful, and it's convincing. For instance, Ryan, who was a client of mine in consulting, came to me and said, Jill, I really want to work with you. And I said, great, Ryan, what do you do? He said, well, I'm an instructional designer. And I thought about that, and I have to tell you, it just wasn't interesting to me. So I said, Ryan, please tell me more about your story. He said, well, you know, I've been downsized from my corporate job. I think they mean fired. At that time, he said, I had a pregnant wife with my third child on the way. I just bought a big house in the Bay Area in California. And on top of that, I had no job. And I thought a minute, and I said, Ryan, that is not a formula for success. I said, what did you do? He said, well, Jill, basically what I did was I created seven employees in eight counties, and I started my instructional design company online. I didn't have any other choice. I said, Ryan, I got it. What you are is a virtual office warrior. And he looked at me and said, what do you mean by that? And if you look at the words virtual office warrior, they spell vow. Ryan took a vow never to work in an office again. Now, that story was powerful. That story for Ryan is absolutely the ooh-ah factor that will create the immediate attention-grabbing headlines and a soundbite that people can remember. A soundbite explains who you are, what you represent, and why you make a difference. So with Ryan, he used everything he got to get publicity. He's actually Asian American. He used his ethnicity because although he doesn't speak a word of Chinese, we translated his speech into Chinese and got it featured into the Chinese Times. Use your special interests. Use religion. Do you know there's all kinds of special interests Religious newspapers like the Catholic Voice, the Jewish Press, use things that make you distinct and what makes you different. Everything works. Let me tell you my own story. 
I had an electric car. Ford made this electric car. We had leased it for three years from Ford, and, well, Ford closed the factory. They decided they were finished with the electric car, and that was it for us, folks. Well, I have to tell you, I was mad. So I called up the media, and I said, you know, I am mad as you know what, and I've got to tell you the story. Now, let me share with you that this is a great little people story. It's us against Ford, the big guys. And so what happened was there were 300, count them, 300 cars that Ford was going to destroy, even though there were 300 people in Norway waiting for these cars in order to use them. Now, what I did, because of the media, an ABC affiliate came out, an NBC affiliate came out and filmed this story. And when they put my picture on TV driving the electric car, under my name it said Jill Lublin, electric car advocate. Now, I have to tell you, I don't know much about electric cars. I'm a publicity expert. I'm an international speaker and a networking expert. But for that moment, my friends, I was an electric car advocate. What story do you have that could be a part of who you are? What can you publicize that is part of who you are and what you do? What problems do you solve? Here's a good rule of thumb. For instance, the question to ask yourself is, what value and benefit do you give to people? An ABC producer I interviewed when I wrote my bestseller, Guerrilla Publicity, said what she cares about is what stops people from, click, click, what do you think, changing the channel. You see, if you solve problems, you're an expert. And remember, at the beginning, what we talked about is being an expert is key to creating media. The media needs you as a resource, and if you solve problems, you're a resource. Then, of course, any problem solver must have solutions. Now, I'd like to suggest to you that if you're solving problems in the world, you've got to give a reporter statistics. For instance, let's say you're an expert in weight loss. You might want to say that 68% of Americans are suffering from weight. 68% of Americans are overweight, and you, of course, are a solution provider. You want to make it easy to create things that people can actually do. However, if you're going to offer solutions, it's very important to think about specific quantities and qualities. If you're a CPA and you help people save money on taxes, you want to help them and say, you know, every month set aside 10% to invest. Every year, make sure to put how much money into your IRA. Tell people what to do because as an expert, as a solution provider, and as a problem solver, you have to remember to make their life easy. Remember that experts tell people what to do, and by creating solutions, you are the resource that the media needs. I advise you to think of three solutions for every problem that you're an expert in. And in those three solutions, tell people a quantity and a quality of exactly how to solve their problem. I suggest the magic of three. People can remember things in threes, and it gives you something to talk about. With your press release, please understand it is the foundation, the very document that actually creates your publicity. It is the one key to your success in getting placed in the media again and again and again. It's called the press release. And you must grab them fast with a press release. Who is them? The media. Because they're the ones reading it. So I prefer that you use statistics. You see, when a media person reads all those press releases, they have to know why it is that what you're writing gives value to their readers, gives value to their listeners, and gives value 
to their viewers. So a few things to keep in mind about press releases. Number one, keep it to one page. Make it simple. And please stay away from jargony language. I know you know your industry. I know you're an expert. But here's the point. With the media, if you can speak in what we call five-year-old language, five-year-old language, you have a much better chance of actually creating far more publicity for you. Know that the first paragraph is the most important. You see, if you can't get a media person to read beyond the first paragraph, how could they read the whole press release? And more importantly, why would you be in the media? So in that first paragraph, set up the problem. Give us the statistic. And keep creating the problem so that the media person knows that you're the expert who must address that problem. And what you then do is give solutions in the next following paragraphs. I like to suggest that you keep your press releases to about four to five paragraphs. And the solution should be in each paragraph, in the second paragraph and the third paragraph, all the way to the end. I recommend that you open up the second paragraph with a quote from you, the expert. Quote yourself, because, of course, the media is going to be interviewing you. So they must understand that you have a great thing to present, that you're the one they want to interview. Now, in a press release, just so you understand a general template, on the upper left side is the words, for immediate release. The truth is, if the press release isn't immediate, please don't send it out. Don't be like what, well, the boy who cried wolf, so that when you actually have news, the media won't pay attention. So make sure that when you send out that press release, you're ready with a real story. On the upper right side of the press release, direct across from the immediate release, is your contact information. Now here's a big gorilla tip for you. On that contact information, I recommend that you put, if you can't afford the publicist, put the name of your grandmother, your brother, your aunt, your uncle, anyone who when they call in, they will know that if they ask for Jim Jones, you're going to say, you know, I'm sorry Jim isn't here, but I'm Jill, the CEO, may I help you? And then the good news is you're direct with the media person and you know that they are the ones calling. It's a great tip and will save you thousands in publicity fees. Now on that first sentence, the first two words you put is what's called the city of origin. So for instance, in parentheses, this begins the press release, you write Los Angeles, comma, C-A, in parentheses, and then dot, dot, dot. Then hit them with the, per, with the percentages. So if you remember our Ryan story earlier, Ryan is a virtual office warrior, and his press release began with 92 million people telecommute. Now that's something that's interesting for a news person because it demonstrates a clear need for Ryan's information. At the end of the press release, end with biographical information. This should be about your fourth paragraph now, and all the contact information for your company. So visit our website, and then put the name of the person they should connect with, as well as the contact information for the company. This features the part about you and your company. This is the part where you can brag about how many years you've been in business, what kind of clients you work with, what's special about you, and of course, the contact information for your company, including website, telephone number, and email. If you want great press releases and samples, please go visit my website at Promising Promotion, that's singular, PromisingPromotion.com, and of course, look in the back of Gorilla Publicity for more press release samples. With your media list, the media list is a set of media contacts. Those are the people who are your gold. They're the people who are going to do your story for you. They're the producers of radio shows, the producers of television shows. They're the editors and reporters. 
They're the people who make the news with you as the expert. They're the decision makers about whether or not you will be in the news. I suggest that with your media list, you play the numbers game. Find the needles in the haystack because that is the easiest thing you can do with the media list. The good news is you don't have to do this research to find great media people. There are numbers of excellent media distribution services, PR Newswire, Business Wire, and in the back of Guerrilla Publicity, we have endless resources for you to find the media list that will best serve the needs that you have. It is really important to target your audience. What I mean by that is know the people who are going to buy your product, hire you for your service, or spend money to make sure that you're the one they want. In other words, who's buying your service? Who's buying your product? Now, I want you to think local, think about national, think about geographic communities. Are these people in your neighborhood? Perhaps they're nationwide. And, of course, what's the demographics? Are they men? Are they women? Are they, how old are they? I'd like you to think about starting small in order to get big. In other words, be a star in your own backyard. It's highly effective to start in your own backyard and make sure that people within your neighborhood, within your community, know who you are. And on the other hand, if they don't or they don't pick it up in your local press, perhaps you're a prophet in your own land, you know that old saying, and you have to go nationwide, go nationwide, become a national expert, and then work backwards. For instance, there's a financial planner I'm working with, and as the new year came up, she talked about how to create wealth for the new year and ongoingly. She became a national expert, and although she only worked with clients in a particular region of the country, she was able to take that nationally generated publicity and send it out to all her clients, thereby leveraging all the publicity she got. Now remember, when you're targeting your audience, Oprah is very different than your local evening news, and your local evening news is different than those morning guys on the radio, and they're different than your daily newspaper. Each one is a very different audience. And if you're on television, know who's on with you. What kind of guests are they? What's the energy of that day? And, of course, knowing the host and how they work will help you be really effective. I'm going to give you a magic formula today. It's the three F's, follow-up, follow-up, and follow-up. You got it. Without it, nothing works. In Guerrilla Publicity, we give you the rule of seven. Seven times you need to pitch the media and to follow up with them. So, for instance... If you are sending out the press release the first time, that counts as one follow-up. Possibly then you'll follow it up with a telephone call. Then you would follow it up with an email. Then maybe a phone call again. Then switch to fax and email and phone and keep varying it until you have followed up with the media at least seven times. I'm pleased to tell you that if you follow that rule of seven, your statistics of actually getting to the media list are at about 25%, which is a huge return, especially when you compare it to direct marketing, which is an average of, let's say, 1%. You know, there's a wrong way and a right way to pitch your story. Let me give you the wrong way first. The wrong way is to call them up and to say, Hi, Jill. I'm Jane, and I'm wondering, did you get the press release about how to create great publicity without spending a fortune? No, because here's the thing. You don't want to say the word press release. The best way to do it is to say, hello, Jill, this is Jane, and I'm wondering if you got the information on how to create great visibility for an entrepreneur who doesn't have a lot of money to spend. Because, you know, the problem today is four out of five entrepreneurs are going to go bankrupt. Why? Because they don't have the money to create the visibility and the marketing that they need. So I can give them quick, easy solutions to get their name out without 
spending a fortune. That is a great pitch. It's simple. It's to the point. It's fast. In fact, frankly, it's probably under 15 seconds. And it did get right to the point. You notice I didn't go on and on about my book, Guerrilla Publicity, on page 85. I didn't tell them anything about that. What I pitched was my expertise. That's what you need to do. Pitch your expertise and how you solve the problem for their readers, their viewers, and their listeners. You know, in 20 years of working with media and a lot of people that I've consulted, I've learned a few things about the media in that, well, it's easy to get them to hate you. And it's difficult to get them to love you. But what I want to do is give, them, give you easy ways for them to hate you. I'm going to do that first, and then afterwards I'll tell you how to make them love you. The first thing is, well, they hate you if you don't take no for an answer. What I mean by that is that let's say you're calling, you're following my rule of seven, and they actually have said no to you. Well, my friends, no is the right answer. In fact, no is a fine answer. What you say is, well, thank you for that, and I'm curious about something. Is there possibly somebody else in the newspaper that I could talk to who might be interested in this story? Or, you know, thank you for sharing that with me. I would love for you to keep me on file as a resource because perhaps you might need this story later. Let me tell you my own story about no. I called an Associated Press person who had done a number of stories for me for years. When Guerrilla Publicity came out, I thought, oh, this is a slam dunk. I called her up and I said, hello, I've got this great book out. I told her how it was great for entrepreneurs and helpful for any business owner in any business, whether corporate or a small business owner, and why. And she said, you know, right now this just isn't the story for me. I said, okay, great, please keep me in mind that if a story comes up, give me a ring. And do you know, three months later, count them, three months, my phone rang early in the morning and it was her for Associated Press working on a story about how to look like the big guys, and she interviewed me. Another, well, no-no, is long news releases. Do not make your news release over one page. That's about four paragraphs, and remembering the format I spoke to you earlier about, it is basically the first paragraph is problem, and then the second paragraph opens with a quote from you, identifies one solution, and the second and third paragraph go into solution and solution and solution, ending with the fourth paragraph with your bio and your information. If you have a long news release, you have too long of a story, and what the media loves is a laser-like news release that gets the information out fast. Another thing the media hates is lying, hype, and misrepresentations. Now, you know, I know you're sitting here thinking, yeah, Jill, but the media are kings and queens of hype. Well, you're right. That is why you can't be. You need to give it to them straight, to tell them the information they need, to present it in a way that they can use, and to make it media friendly so that they understand that when they give it to their readers, their viewers, and their listeners, you're the one who's helping to make a difference for them. If they find out that you, well, shall we call it stretch the truth, if you're talking all about how great you are but not backing it up with anything, you will not be getting media, and they will, you will be off the air so fast, you will see your head spin. Another thing the media hates is lack of preparation. I mean that if you are on a morning show and you understand that the style of the presenter is a certain way, please prepare yourself to banter with them if they are a banterer. If you know that they like big, solid, good information, have that information. If you cannot back up your interview with an ability to, let's say, back up your claims, what's going to happen is you will look ill-prepared, you'll look terrible on camera, 
you'll sound terrible on the phone, and frankly, the media person's going to go, I can't believe I booked you to do an interview. It shows, it really shows when you are not prepared for an interview. So what I like to tell you is be overly prepared for any interview. What else the media hates is small talk. You know, everyone thinks schmoozing. I'll schmooze with the media. And I would suggest to you that schmoozing is out. Forget the schmoozing. It doesn't work anymore. What they like is get to the point, say what you need to say, and tell them how it is that what you have can make a difference. That is something that will support the media to pick you. The media hates, well, what they call overkill. The Today Show producer, when I interviewed her for Guerrilla Publicity, said to me, Jill, you know what I hate? I hate press kits that weigh more than the book. What she said was that she'll get press kits that are so thick and so overdone that basically she couldn't even find the press release. So I suggest to you to have a great press release and that that is what makes great publicity. Don't send them all your fancy stuff. In fact, don't waste your money and send samples and waste a lot of postage sending those fancy media kits. I'd suggest you get them interested first and don't overkill them from the beginning. They hate repeated cold calling. You see, if you are calling and calling and, frankly, they're not responding after those seven times, I would just assume they're not interested. Now, this is one of those items where media felt, well, a bit mixed about. Some said, you absolutely have to call me. I expect it. And I would say to you, when you get the impression from them that they are not interested, please don't keep calling. It's kind of like those telemarketers at night that all of you can't stand. You're going to appear the same way. The media hates freebies. What do I mean by a freebie? Well, for instance, if you think that you can, shall we say, bribe them with uh, perhaps ski tickets. Oh, well, let's give them some ski tickets or a lovely weekend away. They can't actually accept any gifts. Now, usually a limit in most newspapers is up to $25. So you can buy them flowers to thank them for an interview. You can drop off maybe some chocolate chip cookies. We found the media loves those chocolate chip cookies. But I suggest to you that you cannot give the media free gifts or any kind of thing that would imply a bribe. One of my colleagues, a writer for a major daily newspaper, told me a great story. He said one day somebody delivered a pizza to the Features newsroom. And, well, you open up the lid, and guess what was on the top? A press release. He said, you know what we did, Jill? We ripped off the press release, and we ate the pizza. All right, so you've got to assume that they're not always going to be looking at your press releases, no matter how cute you package them. So please understand the media is under obligation not to accept the free gifts. And the only exception to this is, let's say you own a spa. You are allowed to invite them to sample your spa. If you're a professional organizer, for instance, I know a great one who went to her local media person and said, your desk is a mess, and I bet you can't find anything, and I'm going to show you what I do by helping you get organized. Well, by golly, guess what happened? She got a major story from that because the media person was able to see the value of what she did. However, that goes in the category called a sample of your services. Now, the other thing the media hates is name dropping. In other words, if you have a celebrity affiliated with your cause, let's say you're a nonprofit, that's one thing. However, if you say, like, Miss, you know, the mayor of the town is suggesting that I call you, it's not going to do you a darn bit of good. So don't name drop just for the sake of name dropping. They find it offensive, and the only time it works is if one reporter suggested that you call the other reporter. That's okay to do. You can say, 
You know, Jill, uh, James in Features sent me over, let's say I'm the lifestyle editor, and he suggested that I call you. All right, that works. It's a different kind of name dropping, and it implies that you've already talked to people in the media. I'm suggesting that larger name affiliation or celebrities won't always get you the kind of attention you think, and yet, when we get to loves, I may disagree with even that. Now, the other thing the media hates is lack of focus. You know, when you are on their show, they expect you to be a great guest. You see, it's their show. They need a great show. And it's your job to make them look good. And the way to make them look good is to give a focused interview, to get out the message that you need get gotten out, and to get the points across that you want spoken. So I'm going to say to you that no matter what they ask you, if you're on track and you know your message, it almost doesn't matter what they ask you. That's a big hint. Please remember that. They hate it, for instance, on the focus. Let's say that you are talking to an auto magazine and your message is about something unrelated. You need to focus it to autos. So always make sure you're clear about the media that's interviewing you and focus in on what would be beneficial to their readership or their listenership or their viewership. That's what's important to the media person. Now, what else the media hates? They hate those confirmation calls. Those are the calls where you say, excuse me, Jill, did you get the press release? Now, we covered that a lot in follow-up. But I want to remind you that confirmation calls to say, did you get the press release, will not work for you. And I highly advise you against them. You can call and talk about your expertise. You can create an informational interview where you're giving them information and good value. But don't ask them if they got the press release. That is what I call a yes-no question. And when that's over with, where else can you go from there? Well, nowhere. So let's get, in, get you asking and pitching for your expertise and the problems you solve and the solutions you provide. Now, what else they hate is gimmicks. And there are very rare exceptions to this, very rare exceptions. For instance, one time I worked with a national comedian, and he had a box. It, well, it's called the nothing box, and in it it has a thermometer of how much of nothing you really have. A little of nothing, time to get more nothing, and nothing of nothing. It's very funny, and we stuck it inside of reporters' press kits so that they could keep it on their desk, and frankly, years later, they still told me they had it. But let me tell you about something a media person told me about. He said that in the lobby of their daily newspaper, there was a woman who was in a bikini playing a trombone. Well, she got publicity, but not the kind of publicity she wanted. In fact, he couldn't even remember what she was publicizing. He only remembered the woman in the bikini playing the trombone. So be careful of gimmicks. It doesn't often work, kind of like the pizza with the press release. What works is having a great story. The media hates not following up on requests. When they say, send me the press release, please send them the press release. Do it within an hour because they get so many requests. They get so many people vying for their time. You are just one of them. And one of the ways you can separate yourself from the herd, because remember, it's a herd out there, is to follow up on the request. If they say, get me a photo, you say, great. How would you like that? PDF, tip file, would you like it sent to you by mail? When do you need it by? Always ask them these questions and make sure to absolutely follow up on the request quickly and with timeliness because they are on deadlines and they have strict deadlines to follow. By you helping them, you've helped yourself get media. The media hates the same ideas being pitched again and again. 
If they say no to you the first time, what they mean is no. Now, you could say, well, did you think about it this way? If you do that on the same call with them right on the phone, hey, that could work. And I would suggest to you that you do that. But if you call them again three days later and tell them the same pitch, they're going to get upset with you. And so come up with new and innovative ideas. Come up with a new pitch. And don't make them upset by giving them the same ideas. And speaking of getting upset, getting upset is the last thing that we're going to talk about with how to make the media hate you because if you get upset, well, they get upset. I mean, this is not Ms. Maisie's nursery school. You know what I'm saying? you got to be a little tough here. I always say be like a duck, kind of like water running off your back. If a media person is a little rough with you, and sometimes they can be, you just be kind. Don't get upset. Don't lose your temper. And if you get upset, it is the very thing that will keep you from ever getting any more media. Well, those were the don'ts. Now let's talk about the do's. First of all, a thing the media loves is news. I know it sounds obvious, but news is what they need. I remember the CNN reporter I interviewed said, Jill, I can't believe how many people come to me and make stuff up, or they think that their news story is newsworthy. And I would guarantee you that most of you have to angle your story so that it is newsworthy, that if you are talking to a CNN or your morning news producer, it's got to be very newsy. If you're talking to a talk show host, or let's say even a newspaper, and you can talk to the features editor, you have a little luxury of being able to stretch what's newsworthy. But I want you to be thinking from a mentality called, is this news? Is this something that would make me continue to, well, let's say, don't touch that dial? Is this something that would help me to continue to read the newspaper, to read the whole article? So think to yourself, am I the news? Remember that you're the news. And know that the media loves if you can relate how it's newsworthy to them. The media loves brevity. Be clear about what your message is. In other words, don't go on and on. Don't tell them about your kids, your boyfriend, your relationship issues. Don't think that schmoozing with the media is going to get you somewhere, but be brief. Get to the point and tell them what you need next from them. We have found that being specific with media is very helpful to getting your requests granted. In other words, be brave and have brevity, be clear, say what you need, and get to the point with conciseness and precision so that the media can serve you, and more importantly, so you can serve the media. The media loves knowing your targets. There's a big difference between, let's say, Time Magazine and your local daily newspaper. You will approach that media target completely different. It really helps to know your media target's focus for their audience. And then, of course, be precise and be specific with the value and benefit that you can give their target audience. You're going to talk to Oprah's producer very different than you're going to talk to those morning radio show people. And you're going to talk to a daily newspaper completely different than you talk to a daily news show that's on your local ABC, NBC, or CBS affiliate. So know who your target is. Know who they serve so that you can better serve their audience. In doing my research for guerrilla publicity, it was interesting to find out that some of the media loves relationships, and well, some of them don't. But I thought I would share with you today that the media does love relationships, and I want you to be prepared with the fact that some of them don't. 
for those who love relationships, they're the kind who are a little more, well, interactive. They will talk with you a little while longer. They will figure out whether or not you have the kinds of skills that will sustain a media interview. They'll be in relationship to you. But I would also suggest to you that sometimes the media could care less about the relationships. All they want is a great story. So be prepared for the fact that your relationship with the media lasts as long as your interview does. Anything past that is gravy. But your main concern is getting the interview to the point where you're in a great relationship, you have a nice connection, a dynamic interaction, and that in your relating to the media, they really understand your message. And my friends, that is a good media relationship. What the media also loves is preparation. Now, what I mean by that is to be prepared for your interview. We recommend that you have multiple points. Remember that part about the solutions. Have multiple points ready. I often will bring a 3 by 5 index card with my point to my TV interviews. At all my radio interviews, I have both my books, Guerrilla Publicity and Networking Magic, at my fingertips so that if they ask me any question, I absolutely can just open the book and answer their question easily. Be prepared with the message that you want because I will tell you that it absolutely comes down to your preparation. How good the media interviews go is completely dependent on you. Yes, I know, you thought it was the media person asking the great question. I'm going to suggest to you that the media loves somebody who's prepared, who can easily segue into a longer interview. I was recently on an NBC show in Sacramento, California. I was on for four minutes, and what happened was the next guest didn't appear. So guess what happened to me? I got eight minutes on air. Why? Because I was prepared. They scrolled down my points. I was able to talk on each one of them. They had me answer questions from the studio audience. I knew my material. I knew the main points to get across. And I ask you to be able to do the same and to be prepared for any media interview, depending on the style of the interviewer, understand that they have different styles, and know that your presentation will make all the difference. The media loves broad appeal. Now, that means that your story, obviously, if you're in a local paper, that's broad appeal. You want to be attractive to the local community. If you're in USA Today, you're going to have a very different appeal, and you must speak your message much more broadly. You must identify to them why it is that your message is great for a nationwide readership. So make sure that if you are going after national appeal, you have a very broad ability to explain your message. You have the ability to explain why it's relevant to their readers and viewers and listeners. If you want to be on the Today Show or Good Morning America, again, you have to say to them, listen, here's why my message will appeal to your viewers. The media loves having ties. For instance, being tied to a local community event is wonderful to get great publicity. Being tied to a national trend is excellent for visibility. So if you're a psychologist, when something traumatic happens on a nationwide level, I'm going to tell you to run to the phones and to tie yourself in to a national trend and put yourself out there as the expert on that trend. Tie yourself to a trend. Tie yourself to a local news story. Put yourself into a local community event so that your message has, well, what I might call the octopus legs into the community that you're after. The media loves experience. You know, they're kind of like a club. If you've been featured in your local daily newspaper, 
And then you go to your local news station and you say, hey, I've been featured in my local daily newspaper and I'd like you to cover me. Here are some of the things we can talk about. Here's what I'm an expert in. I'm guaranteeing you they will listen because they figure that if you've had experience on t TV, that, well, you'll be good for other TV. If you've had experience in radio, you'll probably do a great job on other radio. For instance, one of my clients was featured on a major daily show. It was the Today Show. And so at that time, we sent out a press release and said, they have been featured on the Today Show. And then, of course, went through their message and a little more about who they are and got all kinds of stimulating experiences by showing that they were on the Today Show. Because we sent out that press release, and because they already were on the Today Show, do you know what happened from that? They got on another national news show. They got on many local news shows, like your morning shows you see in the morning, and they were able to leverage this publicity all across the nation by being on one national show because it showed experience, it showed ease, and the fact that they could do it. The media loves visualization. I mean charts, graphs, things you can show them. They love it when they can actually go to a TV cut, this is more for TV, and demonstrate what it is you're talking about. For instance, you see on camera actual graphics as we've been talking. That's something visual. When you can do that on television, your chances are much greater of actually increasing your time. So think about things that make your message more visual. And certainly charts, graphs, illustrations, have a fun toy that you could throw around so they can feel it. Obviously, if you're a book, you want the book out on the table if you're an author. So have something that can demonstrate to the audience what it is you're talking about. And then often, for instance, when you're on television, if, let's say you have five main points, they may actually put them point by point onto the screen. You often want to be able to refer to that, and they will often refer back and forth to you. So take a look at what things make you more visually exciting and more stimulating. Another thing the media loves is celebrity tie-ins. I know in the previous segment I told you they hate that only if you name dropped. If you have a celebrity and can tie it into your media message, absolutely use it. I mean, look what Christopher Reeve did for stem cell research. That's a great celebrity tie-in now, isn't it? So if there's something that makes your media message pop, and it's a local celebrity or a national one, or it's an industry celebrity, absolutely use it. I highly recommend it. Certainly look for somebody who can tie into your message and make it work for you. The media loves prompt response. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that if they call you and you haven't called back within 24 hours, your story is gone. If you remember earlier, I shared the Associated Press story with you. She's out of New York. I'm in California. She called me, it was 5.30 in the morning, because it was 8.30 in New York, and she was on deadline. Since I was able to call her back fairly quickly, I was also able to get the story happening. I encourage you and tell you, though, that if you don't respond quickly, for instance, send them the photo when they request it, respond to their calls, and answer their queries, that your chances for media are far diminished. If you can quickly say to the media, you know, I don't quite know the answer to that, but let me put you on hold and call one of my colleagues, and I'll get right back to you. I would tell you when a media person is on the phone, don't let them off the phone, because it's so hard to get them back on the line without a voicemail and all that stuff in between. I would recommend that immediately when you get an inquiry from a media person, you quickly respond to them. You answer their specific question, and you give them everything they need to make the interview work, whether that's a photo, 
whether that's a specific press release, whether it's an interview with you, certainly you want to make their job easy. The media loves courtesy. Now what do I mean by that? I know that sounds obvious, but you would be surprised how many people, when they call the media and ask for, well, an interview, they aren't very courteous. You almost expect it, and the truth is the media doesn't have to give you it. It is their job to get the news out, but they don't have to be nice to you. So a simple rule, it's the golden rule, is practice being nice to the media. Because the truth is, they frankly work hard, they have demanding deadlines, they have editors breathing down their back, if they're a producer, they need to get a show finished quickly and often with very tight deadlines. So imagine if you're the voice of courtesy, of kindness, of ease and grace. Your chances of moving up in the line to actually get a media interview are, well, far enhanced. So a small, simple courtesy will make huge differences with your publicity possibilities. The media loves visual aids. Now this was similar to what we said before, but again, think about how can you be more exciting. There was a gentleman from a daily TV show out of Portland, Oregon, who said to me, you know, I have wonderful people with great stories, but I can't put them on because, well, they're talking heads, or they just don't have anything to support their message. And when I'm on TV and I've got a host there, I need to have somebody who can interact, who can demonstrate with fun and unusual things of some kind of visual aid, literally. So be thinking as you create your message, how can you support your message with a visual aid? The media loves no roadblocks. The editor from Fast Company, great magazine, said to me, Jill, you know what I love? The concierge approach to media. She wanted her job to be made so easy. And she said to me, you know, I get 150 emails, well, sometimes every six hours. I have 20 to 30 calls coming in every single hour. And I have to write stories and take care of all my writers and run a magazine. The truth is, I don't have time to listen to everybody's story. I want you to make my job easy, she said. And she wanted what she called the concierge approach to media. I thought that was a great way to put it. Make the media's job simple. Give them easy things that they can interview you off of. Give them colleagues of yours that they can, well, make the story bigger and bolder. Make it easy and don't put any roadblocks between you and them. Everything from you is a yes. Oh, yes, I'd love to do that. How can I make it easier for you? May I get you some background information on this story? Give them links to other stories. You remember the electric car story I told you earlier about myself? Well, guess what? In our press release, in our email to the media, we had five links that can connect them to any part of this story and made their job so much easier. That's your job. Make their job easy. And another thing the media loves is a pleasant attitude. I mean, be joyful to work with. Be somebody they want to talk to. Don't get too upset if for some reason now is not the moment to do your story. If you can gracefully say, well, I understand. Thank you for hearing me out. I appreciate you listening. And I would love it if you could put me on as a resource, a person that you can call when you need an expert in this matter. I really appreciate you taking a few moments with me today to listen to my story. It will ring in their minds that perhaps when they have a story about what you're pitching, when they need an expert that knows what you know, guess who they're going to think of? That would be you. One thing I want to remind you about is to be always well too prepared for an interview. What do I mean by that? 
Many of you don't understand that media people, well, they just don't have time. They haven't read your books. They haven't read over your whole press release. In fact, frankly, you're lucky if the interviewer even read your press release or any of your company material before you walked on the set or before they started interviewing you. The reality is don't expect them to know your subject matter. Don't expect them to know anything about you, in fact, or your company or your service. More importantly, don't expect them to understand your message because it is up to you to know your message. And what I'd like you to do is prepare at least five main points using those problem solution formula. And then underneath each main point, have 15 to 20 subpoints to reel off. See, you never know how long your interview is going to go. Remember the Sacramento show I was telling you about? I went from four minutes to eight minutes quickly. And frankly, had I not been prepared and known my messages, that would have been an opportunity that would have been a disaster. So know your messages at all times and strengthen them by using anecdotes, stories, jokes and statistics, make your points entertaining and memorable. Well, frankly, it takes a lot of practice. So the third step is to appear natural and spontaneous and unrehearsed. You know what that takes? A lot of practice. Practice, practice, practice. I'm continuously practicing. If I have a three-minute interview on television, I will often practice three to four hours. I've been in this business 20 years, have owned a PR agency and worked with all kinds of people as a consultant, many kinds of businesses, from the small business to the corporate. And one thing I've learned is you must take command of the interview. You must make sure that you know your message. And it almost doesn't matter what the interviewer asks you. I love to, to say that many of you wait for what I call the great question. Maybe she'll ask me the great question. Well, maybe she won't. And what's so key is that you must know your message. You must know what it is you're going to say. And frankly, get out your main points right out the gate. Don't wait for anything. Don't sit there and go, well, maybe she'll get to the question. Make sure that you know what your message is. Don't alienate the interviewer, though. Just make sure to get your message out. And, of course, prepare for the unexpected. You know, you just don't know when something like a national event might happen, in which case your news interview will be cut Perhaps they've been in your office filming for three hours, and when you watch the news at 6 that night, you will see 20 seconds. And I'm going to ask you for it to be the best 20 seconds of your entire life, and to be grateful for all the media you get, because frankly, it's all good. It builds momentum, and it's wonderful to create media in every step of the way. So be happy with Every piece you get, whether it's a 20-second spot, a three-minute interview, an eight-minute interview, or an hour radio show, it varies tremendously in media, and you want to be prepared for every step of the way. So know how much time you're being interviewed for. Know that little things can happen, and it may increase instantly. Watch yourself and film yourself for little nuances. Ways that you move your head, perhaps. Little things that make you look funny, those tics or those funny expressions you might make. Make sure to watch yourself. It's easy to do it. And then I also would recommend that you record yourself on tape. And again, be listening for those oohs and ums and ahs and those funny little voice things that we do. Watch that your voice is enthusiastic and exciting and, of course, smile when you're on radio because when you're smiling, you can hear that on film. When you're also doing radio interviews, I suggest that you stand up. I know you may be at home in your jammies, but stand up and smile. It will make all the difference for your radio interview. Remember, being overly prepared will ensure 
that the media interview is the one that you want. Be thinking in headlines. In fact, learn to speak in headlines. Get yourself headlines. They're kind of like sound bites that people will pay attention to. Look for the nuggets and the jewels to catch people's eyes and catch their ears. Sit down and write out a number of headlines and then start talking them to people. See how they respond. Of course, money, sex, health, that always works. You have to understand the headlines that you put on your press releases don't always have to do with the whole rest of the press release. What's the purpose of a headline? We want the press to read the whole press release. And if they read it because of the headline, then you've done your job. So you want to create a headline that is what I call sexy and interesting, often confrontive. There's a psychotherapist I worked with, and she helped people create more well, relaxation in their life and get rid of stress. One of the things she wanted for a headline was, what they taught you in school might kill you. And I said, well, how about what they didn't teach you in school will kill you. Now, it's a small change. It's more strong. It's dynamic. It has a rhythm. And I have to tell you the truth. The whole rest of the press release didn't reflect that headline, but we got people to read it. And in the press release, she talked about how to be more stress-free. So you want to see what headlines are working. Make sure that when you go to parties and gatherings that you try out your headlines on people and you see if they do grab the attention of your listener. Really what you have to do is grab the listener in about 15 seconds in an easy way that helps them understand, oh, okay, this is something I want to pay attention to. Because most of you will scan the headlines of the newspaper and then decide if you want to keep reading. I also would challenge most of you that if you think for a minute right now, the only thing you might remember from yesterday's news is the headline. So you want to have headlines that other people will want to read. And most of all, that other people will remember. Today you and I have covered a lot. We've gone over how to write press releases, how to get a message that works, what problem and solution you provide, how to write press releases, and certainly all the things the media loves and hates so that you can be a champion in the media. Mostly I want you to be overly prepared for any interview at any time. And I certainly know that today I've given you some nuggets and jewels of information that if you use them, you will see your PR results exponentially grow and your fame and visibility increase like a volcano. But you have to do them. And you have to take baby steps to keep your name visible in the news and to create the ongoing I've heard of you somewhere syndrome. So I'm going to leave you with my challenge to you today. I appreciate you spending the time with me. As my friend Scoop Nisker says, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own.